Actually, this, uh, <laughs> this, this, type, this type is a line. Um, so this is perhaps closer, but... Uh, <laughs> actually, actually, this is also closer. Uh, okay. So here's the plan. Um, I, we've, so, so people have kind of been studiously avoiding metaphysics so far. <laughs> uh, to uh, go back and remind you of some of the things that uh, uh, the, the greats said uh, in the late 80s and early 90s. Uh, so this will involve uh, giving uh, a version of the whole argument. And I felt embarrassed about this, but then I was reassured that uh, both Brian and Jim in different ways actually gave versions of the whole argument that are different to the one that I'm going to give, so it does seem <laughs> that it's worth doing that. Um, in response to that version of the whole argument, I'll just map out in a rather kind of sketchy, hopping about way, some of the metaphysical positions that are relevant to uh, deciding what you should conclude from it. Um, one of the thing, things I want to pause on is a couple of different definitions of determinism, and also this issue of uh, distinction with respect to the whole argument of, uh, between general relativity and pre-general relativistic theories. Um, and I had a third thing on here, but I'm not going to talk about that, namely how the whole argument relates to Putnam's paradox. It seems to me that these three things are the ones that there's perhaps not quite uh, consensus on. Um, this is interesting, I think, in light of uh, what Jim has done recently, because um, if you take his line on uh, the way isomorphic uh, structures represent, then you uh, seem to be committed to well, I, I thought you might be committed to, to difficult positions with respect to, for example, um, uh, the models of a classical theory set in Newtonian spacetime. Uh, you're committed to regarding um, models where you boost the matter by a static shift, sort of just pick up the matter and replace it five feet to the left, as, uh, well, you, you can't regard two models the isomorphic and related by the relevant symmetry as representing exactly that distinction, that confusion has in a sense been cleared up just by Sam, so that's great. Yay! And, uh, <laughs> yeah, and then, then I'll finally get round to, to whether uh, all of this earlier stuff has been a horrible mistake. Uh, <laughs> so, uh, let me just um, introduce a couple of models. Um, so we have two space-time models, M0 and M1, uh, and they're related by a diffeomorphism. So a diffeomorphism from the manifold of one to the manifold of the other. If you drag along the metric of the first and the stress-energy tensor of the, the first to the second, then they match the metric and the stress-energy tensor of the, the second model. So these uh, two models are isometric, and the diffeomorphism D is uh, the map between them that uh, corresponds to, to the isometry. And uh, let's further suppose that actually we've got the very same base manifold in these two models, and that the diffeomorphism uh, happens to be the identity outside region R, but within region R it's uh, not the identity. So this is just to remind you of uh, what it is for two models to be related by a whole diffeomorphism. And let's uh, mention, although I actually may not come back to this, uh, let's introduce a third model, uh, M2, which is related to M1, just as M1 is related to M0. Okay. Um, fine. So we've got three <coughs> mathematical objects, which are numerically distinct. We think we do have three. They're equivalent with respect to a certain mathematical standard of equivalence, but we think we've got numerically distinct objects. Um, and as I say, M1 stands to M0, this is M2 stands to M1. And uh, we call models related in this way, uh, related that they're, they're said to be related by a whole few morphisms. Okay, so what is the whole argument? I'm going to suggest that there are three key ingredients. So the first is, uh, if our theory is generally covariant, so it's the general covariance of general relativity that's meant to be important in uh, showing that general relativity is susceptible to the problem. If a theory is generally covariant, 
then whenever we've got two models related in this way, if one is a model, if, if ever we've got two mathematical objects related in this way, if one's a model of the theory, so is the other. Um, so two, um, the space-time substantive list must regard uh, these two mathematical objects as representing distinct possible situations. Uh, let's call them P0 and P1. And I'm introducing this because uh, I think it's right that uh, in Jim's paper there's this refreshing explicit emphasis on representation. I don't think it's right to, to say that that was absent uh, from uh, most of the discussion following Erwin and Norton's papers. You may argue that it was perhaps not as clear as it always should have been, that some page, sometimes people were confusing models for the, the situations that they represented. But as you go through the literature in the late 80s, early 90s, this distinction between model and what's represented by the model is drawn pretty clear, clearly. And so clearly, in fact, that there are lots of people explicitly on record of rejecting this way of talking, saying they don't like talk of you know, the space of possibilities that various models can stand in many one or many, many relationships to. So I, I don't think that's a new thing. But anyway, I'm taking this to be key, the whole argument, as presented by Erwin Norton and others. It's a claim about substantivalism and how substantivists must uh, interpret these two models, M0 and M1. And then uh, <coughs> three, the claim is that if a theory interpreted according to a certain metaphysics says uh, that both P0 and P1 are physically possible, as the uh, uh, substantivalist is said to do of GR, uh, given 1 and 2, then that theory is indeterministic. So, at this point, the interim conclusion is just that the substantivalist has to regard GR as indeterministic. Of course, there's then the further claim that uh, to regard it indeterministic in this way is problematic, and so you should give up substantivalism. But I take it that uh, this is a key Claim, and that a lot of the literature responding to Erwin and Norton is uh, stopping at this point and arguing about whether uh, this claim about substantivist interpretation of GR is uh, true. And they standardly do so by denying to. Um, okay. <laughs> well, um, yeah, so three, as it's worded here, is, um, uh, so, so they might, so, so certainly some people would deny something close to three. Three here is saying that the theory says that these distinct possibilities, distinct in a, particularly, a particular way, namely, that, so I will come on to say that these two possibilities are possibilities that differ merely hexiatistically, and yeah, you can deny that by saying determinism is just about whether the qualitative past fixes the qualitative future. Uh, there, may be in, there may be these hexiatistic differences between genuinely possible situations, but we're not going to call a theory indeterministic on that basis. Okay. So, I take it for the purpose of today, this is the, the key thesis that is controversial, but I will uh, say a little bit about 1 and 3 before coming back to 2. So general covariance. So it looks like uh, if M0 and M1 both satisfy the equations of the theory, surely we have to regard both <coughs> as representing uh, a possibility. Or if we regard one as representing a possibility, then we have to regard uh, the other doing so. What became clear in response uh, to, in, in the early responses to the whole argument, was that, there, that, that, that this claim is relative to how you think the representation relation between models and possibilities work. And in particular, for some ways of understanding that representation relation, both of these two uh, um, positions, and even actually the hexiatistic substantivists will deny uh, that, uh, well, sorry, they won't, they won't, so the hexiatistic uh, substantivists will not deny this. They might deny, depending on what R you choose, uh, 
that uh, M0 and M1 represent different possibilities. But uh, let me just spell out quickly why, for certain choices of R, the metric essentialist and the anti hexiotist are going to deny um, that uh, just because the two models satisfy the equations of the theory, if you take one to represent a possibility, you have to take the other to do so. Maudlin thinks, so Maudlin's metrical essentialist position is the following. Uh, given a possibility, given a space-time that's possible according to the theory of GR, if you consider, uh, if, you, if, if you describe the metaphysical situation involving the very same space-time points, um, structured in the very same um, geometrical ways, but just different points having different properties, then that is not a genuine possibility according to, to Morley. So consider a particular point uh, of a genuinely possible space-time, consider its various geometrical properties, it's metaphysically impossible, according to Morvin, for that point to exist with different geometrical properties to those it has. Now, if you're Maudlin, you can take M0 to represent that possibility. You can take M1 to represent that very same possibility. So there's nothing in Maudlin's position that's denying one of Jim's key theses that M0 and M1 have exactly the same representational capacities. But what Morden would like to say, and what I think Jim wants to not let him say, is that if you take M1 to represent that possibility, and if you understand R to work in a certain way, namely the manifold points of the mathematical model act like names of the concrete space-time points that they're representing, then relative to that representation relation, M1 represents something that isn't even a metaphysical possibility. Um, so that's the metric essentialist position, where, understood in a certain way, they're going to say, if you take M0 as representing a possibility, M1 does not represent a possibility. The anti-hexiotist uh, is a position, he, he has a position which in some ways is like Morgan's. Um, they will deny that there are <coughs> two possible space-times that can differ just over which space-time points have which geometrical properties. Um, but they don't insist um, that a given space-time points met, um, essential pro um, actual geometrical properties are essential to it. Um, whether they should accept this or not uh, is um, arguable in different ways. So let, so let me, I, for, for reasons of time, let me just move on. So just like <coughs> the metrical essentialist as an example in this case. Okay, so determinism. Well, I'm going to just quickly go through three different views, three different formal definitions of determinism that have been given, which you might accept kind of fairly independently of the metaphysical positions you're going to adopt. So take a particular mathematical object to be a model S, with uh, manifold M, and the A, I's, and P, J's are uh, to stand for absolute object and physical object. So the absolute objects are ones which are uh, the same in all models of your theory. The physical objects are ones that are very interesting uh, uh, field equations and can vary uh, from model to model in interesting ways. And let this map between them be a map that preserves the absolute object. So just the fact that we're calling these absolute, absolute objects says there are these, uh, uh, for, for any two models, there's always going to be a diffeomorphism of this kind. That's just what it is for the, uh, for the object to be an absolute object. And in GR, there are no such objects like that, unless you're going to, well, that, that in itself is controversial, but let's just assume for simplicity that in GR there are no such uh, absolute objects. So, any diffeomorphism at all satisfies that condition. So here are three definitions of determinism. This is the one that gives you according to, uh, well, so, so we're going to say that uh, the theory is deterministic just in case that all such maps, um, if the map preserves physical objects on some special region, so for example the past before some uh, slice, then it's got to preserve the, uh, the physical objects for all of 
uh, the, the model. And if it doesn't do that, the theory is indeterministic. Here's a slightly different one. It says for all such maps, uh, if uh, that such a map preserves um, uh, the p's uh, restricted to this uh, region, mapping between s and s prime, then there's got to be some other map which agrees with d on this region, but can be extended to the entire model such that uh, that map will preserve the dynamical objects. And then finally you could have exactly the same thing, but you say uh, there's just got to be, if, if, if the two models, I mean we're effectively saying if the two models are isomorphic on region R, they've got to be isomorphic everywhere. And uh, this <coughs> third definition was the one that Jeremy uh, in his uh, classic uh, The Whole Truth paper. Now, according to one, GR is indeterministic. And in a way, one is just the, the, the standard definition according to which GR will be indeterministic. But what's interesting is that this is the definition that Ehrman gives at the end of World Enough in Space Time, so that he's got a definition according to which pre generally relativistic theories are deterministic. Uh, so they are on definition one. According to three, Jeremy's definition, GR is deterministic, so that seems good. And you could just say that this is what you mean by determinism, even if you believe that there are these hexatistic differences. You just think physics doesn't care about those, and we're not going to call physics deterministic on that result. But as is well known, there are certain counterexamples to this where intuitively indeterministic uh, theories get labeled deterministic on this view. So this motivates moving to two, which is related to a type of definition discussed by Joe Media. It's actually a, the, the, the definition that uh, Ehrman adopts more recently. And according to this definition, GR is deterministic. The problem cases are indeterministic. Great. So that's just to say, here's one nice thing we've clarified, thanks to the whole argument. We've kind of honed in on this nice definition of determinism, which seems to get things right. Okay, so let's go back to the, the, the controversial uh, claim that the space-time substantivist must regard M0 and M1 as representing distinct possible situations, the so-called acid test of substantivalism. I've already told you about metrical essentialism and uh, mentioned anti-hexitist substantivalism, both views that will deny this. Um, but let me, I mean, so, so these two points are intertwined. <coughs> Right back in the immediate aftermath of, of uh, Erwin and Norton's paper, in Morden's PSA symposium paper, he mentions a possible way of understanding the models, namely <coughs> something called the Ramsifying substantivist. So the Ramsifying substantivist just treats uh, the manifold points of two different models as functioning like existentially bound variables in first order logic. So they're like purely qualitative descriptions of the geometrical structure. So two models that differ just by permutation points are going to describe exactly the same thing structurally. So already he's considering this kind of way of thinking about the, the way the models represent according to which they just represent uh, you know, this particular geometrical structure, field coincidences, all the rest, exactly what uh, Jim says, this is what you should understand uh, different uh, isomorphically related models as having in common, and that's what their representational capacity is. But of course, he says, well, you could treat them like that, but actually this would prevent your articulating what's distinctive about substantivalism, namely what Leibniz and Clark agreed on, that if you're a substantivalist, then shifting everything five feet to the left is a different situation. And it looks like there's a very natural way of understanding these mathematical objects according to which two distinct objects of that kind jointly can represent exactly that difference between possibilities. So he wants to insist that there is this way of treating the models according to which manifold points act like names. And then we can ask, well, according to these different metaphysical versions of substantivism, what should we say uh, about the models when we're thinking about that type of representation relation. Do these metaphysical positions <coughs> and that type of representation relation? 
According to the HEC statistics subsentive list, yes, they do. And according to the HEC statistics subsentive list, the two models represent different possibilities that differ exactly in the HEC statistic way. According to the metrical essentialist, as I've already said, if you treat one as representing the possibility the other represents something metaphysically impossible, and I'll just repeat this for the sake of clarity. Actually, I won't because it's on a later slide. Finally, the anti hexitist substantive list, I'm, I'm going to skip again because of time. Uh, happy to talk about that in, uh, once I finish. Okay, so here's an interim set of conclusions. Uh, according to what I've said, the hexitist substantive list is entitled. They don't have to, but they're entitled to treat M0 and M1 as representing distinct possibilities. Uh, and the whole argument highlights that according to this way of interpreting them, GR is indeterministic in a particular sense, i.e. the sense that definition one uh, clarifies. Um, if you're an anti-hexitist, then you block the whole argument because you uh, block the option that says M0 and M1 can jointly represent distinct possibilities. Basically, the, the anti-hexitist position is one that insists that this representation relation is many one. So according to a particular equivalence class of models uh, related uh, by whole diffeomorphisms, there is only one metaphysical possibility that it can represent. So either you, and, and this is where the um, issue of whether you take them uh, as jointly representing the same possibility or whether you think, suppose I take one as representing that possibility, well that's precluded by taking the other as representing that possibility. I take it that, 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 that which of those is right is less important than the, the key claim, which is relative to this equivalence class, there's only one physical possibility that's up for being, being possibly represented by any element of it. So that's the anti hexitis view. And uh, one thing that I will claim but not defend right now, again, I'm happy to talk about it, is that this nice definition of determinism that I gave is completely consistent with the anti hexitist view and can be motivated by it and defended with respect to it. So one thought is that if you're an anti hexitist you're committed to regarding certain things intuitively that are intuitively indeterministic as deterministic, I say, no, you don't. You can adopt this definition. That makes perfectly good sense uh, if you're an anti hexitist OK, so uh, finally, on to uh, Jim's thesis. And I think I'm doing OK for time. So, uh, Go on for uh, at least five minutes. Thank you. So, um, these are the things that I want to focus on. So, one clear thing that he wishes to uh, emphasize is that M0 and M1 have identical representational capacities. It seems as if one thing that's already been pretty much clarified today is that that's uncontroversial. <laughs> <laughs> right, so two. Uh, he also, perhaps you know, surprisingly, does agree that one can interpret M0 and M1 as representing the distinct possibilities, but he will insist to do so precludes regarding them as physically equivalent. So, as we will see when we look at some quotes, there's this kind of charge that the person pushing the whole argument is engaged in some kind of equivocation. They are using one way of comparing two models to say one thing, which they do want to say, but they're using another way of comparing them to say another thing, which they also want to say, and they can't have it both ways. That's, that's the charge. And then, you know, kind of specific version of this, uh, I, I, I mean, maybe I'm wrong in this, but uh, if I'm not wrong in this, then you wonder, well, who did anything wrong ever? <laughs> <laughs> it seems as if the hexitist substantive interpretation, which is the thing that's kind of uh, meant to be under attack and undermined by the whole argument uh, shouldn't be an option. In fact, it's, it's, it's exactly trying to have this kind of interpretation that uh, involves the equivocation uh, in question. Okay, so now let's give some quotes which uh, clarify this. Uh, okay, well, firstly, we won. No one should disagree. And we uh, consider John Norton's misdirected criticism of metrical essentialism. So right after Maudlin, you know, right in the early days of uh, you know, the aftermath of Norton and Norton's paper, uh, Norton has this following objection to uh, Maudlin's metrical essentialism. He says, look, Maudlin, you say, uh, we've got all these models, 
and at most one of them represents a genuine possibility. All the rest are, represent metaphysically impossible si uh, situations, according to you. Well, you owe us an expert, you owe us an account of which of these models is the one that represents the real possibility. That's just a, you know, that's not attacking metrical essentialism. That's attacking this. Uh, you had a phrase for it, uh, Sam, which is kind of a representational uniqueness or something. The idea that each model represents a unique possibility. It's clear that the way you should have thought about this all along is that uh, I can take any that they're, they're all equally apt at representing possibilities uh, that, that don't differ qualitatively. But if I pick one, then relative to that choice, I can regard the others as representing different possibilities. So Maudlin's answer to Norton's criticism should be, well, um, you know, I, I just... Suppose I'm seeking to represent the actual world. I can pick any one of these, but relative to that choice, all the other models represent uh, impossible situations. So um, a similar thing can be said about the mathematics that represents parity, violation, and handedness, and so on. There's nothing intrinsic in the mathematics that represents left versus right, um, but relative to one choice, uh, and given certain hexiotistic uh, assumptions, the other uh, element of formalism represents the other possibility. Okay, finally, on to what I take to be a few key passages of, of Jim's paper. So, this is what he says uh, on page 10 of the second version of the archive volume. Is that the most recent version? It's, it is, I think. Yeah. Uh, and it's, it's from last summer. <laughs> uh, I, I'm breaking... You, this it still says do not cite. But, uh, yeah. <laughs> uh, so I'm sorry. I mean, cite the published version. Yeah. yeah, yeah. Um, I will delete this file. <laughs> 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 Destroy the blood. Right. Okay. <laughs> um, so we have our two models, MG and MG tilde. Uh, they're isometric. They have uh, all of the same invariant observable structure. Well, if we say this about them, then we're comparing them relative to this map phi tilde. Tilde, sorry. Indeed, we must be, because as in the previous example, there is no sense in which, uh, and this is just the identity map of, on the manifold, either is or gives rise to an isometry. Um, in other words, relative to the identity map, these two uh, models are not equivalent physically or otherwise. The reason is that there exist points uh, in O of which, uh, so O is the whole, in which uh, the metric at P is different from the metric G tilde at uh, P. Um, okay. So here's what I find slightly confusing about this. So when we say that these two things are isometric, that claim is said to be relative to psi tilde. Now, I, I find this a slightly confusing way of putting things. So psi, not psi tilde, psi is the map of M to itself, which we've used to uh, define G tilde in the first place. And you might say of two objects that they are isomorphic, just in case there is some way of mapping the points of the manifold of one to the points of the manifold of the other, such that under that map, the drag-alongs are uh, equal. Well, the drag-along of one is equal to the, the, the objects on the other. Now, that uh, map is what gives you the map between them, this side tilde. But it's the existence of such a map that means the two models are isomorphic or isometric simpliciter. It's not that they're isometric relative to the map. It's not, you can't say that they're isometric but only relative to the map. They are isometric full stop. It's the existence of the map which means that they're isometric, the, the existence of the map of the right kind. So when I say something about them relative to 1M, well first of all, I don't really understand this locution relative to, to 1M. And notice here there's something a bit odd because psi tilde is a map between models, but this isn't. This is a, this is a map uh, from M to itself. Um, anyway, so let's just rehearse what, why, if we're thinking about it in the second way, should we say that they're not equivalent? Well, consider an observer sitting at a point of space-time represented by P. Uh, according to one, 
model, that observer is going to see certain geometrical properties. According to the other model, that observer is going to see something different. Clearly, these are different. So it looks like Jim is trying to say the only way in which you can think of these as representing different things and being not physically equivalent is if you imagine an observer sitting at P. It's if you're imagining something outside of what's represented here, and then you're going to think that these two represent different situations for that observer. Now clearly that's not how the hexatistic self is, is, is going to want to think of these as different, because for them, the observer's described in, in the T of the model, right? There's nothing outside. Uh, so that way of understanding the differences is open to them. So I take it this is the absolutely key passage. Or, uh, so here's a, there's a kind of interim conclusion. Jim says, insofar as one wants to claim that these manifolds are equivalent, one has to use this map to compare them. Um, insofar uh, as one wants to claim that these are that they assign different metrics to each point, one must use a different standard of comparison, and relative to this standard, the two Lorentzian manifolds are not equivalent. So I take it actually that the hexitis subsantibilis will not disagree with this. They will say, in order to recognize these two models as representing different possibilities, you have to understand, you have to compare them by the identity map. This is just what's going on here. So what we have is, uh, you know, hexatistic situ... So, so these are P0 and P1. And if we take this representation relation and go from this model to this model via uh, 1M, we end up by putting along the representation relation so this model gets mapped to there. So basically, the hexatistic subsantibus is saying uh, each of these can equally represent both of these. But there's a way of thinking of them as having a joint representational capacity which this relation between them encodes, according to which, if I take this one to represent this, this one represents this. So this is just to say, Sam's machinery, applied to the whole argument, vindicates the hexatistic substantivist interpretation of the machinery. Um, so, <laughs> final thought, suppose you don't buy that. Suppose Jim is right, that there's just no cosmological interpretation that's legitimate according to which M0 and M1 uh, represent these different possibilities. But hexitis substantivalism is a perfectly coherent, perhaps wrong, but perfectly coherent metaphysical, metaphysical position. All he showed is that, for some reason that I haven't understood, you can't use these mathematical objects to represent in a very natural way what that metaphysical position believes in, right? So suppose that's all true. That doesn't show that according to this metaphysical position, GR uh, is an indeterministic theory in the relevant sense. Because what it's shown is that GR, the machine we use for GR, for some reason can only differentiate between qualitatively distinct situations. Um, but we're recognizing in our metaphysics that there are these differences, and our theory just doesn't, uh, physical possibility isn't constrained with respect to them. Therefore, they can do what they like independent of physical modality, which is just to say that uh, general relativity is indeterministic uh, according to that metaphysical position. Why do we know that? Well, because we've thought about exactly the kind of things that the whole argument uh, directed us to. So, that's it. <laughs>